Hi, this is Pastor Eric Little, and I want to thank you for joining me online. Right now, I've been teaching over the last couple of weeks about walking in spiritual authority and understanding the power that comes to us through the blood covenant of Christ. You know, all over the world and as we presently sit here, there are people that are being miseducated. And there are also people who are walking with no true connection to Jesus Christ. And, you know, from now until the Messiah returns, there are two types of people that will be tormented, that will that will be ruled over, that will be dominated by Satan. And that is people who are uncovered and people who do not understand their spiritual authority. And I don't want you to be one of those people that are dominated when you should be dominating. I don't want you to be one of those people that are ruled when you should be ruling. And so I challenge you as you tune into today's um, series and this message today to take notes and to really put the work in on understanding who you are in Christ, because there's so much that you have to do in your life. And it's so much God has allotted to you if you only get the understanding. This is Pastor Little. Thank you so much for joining me. I know that some of you might have said, now, why, why, why did Pastor show us that? But I wanted you to hear how real what we're doing is, but I wanted you to hear what the unseen realm, the demonic realm, really thinks about us. They think, the enemy thinks that we're nothing more than just a bunch of people coming together with no power. We don't really understand and know the authority we've been given. The authority we've been given in Christ. And so I, I, I want you to see that. Number two, I want you to see that this, little, this young man said that he had been sitting in demonic church when they're being prepared from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Religious. Consistent. The faithfulness of that young man to that kingdom that was leading him nowhere. This is the reason why I push the way I do. I push the way I do with us because, guys, the, the, the arts and the enemy is building up stacks and walls against the church to keep us from prevailing. And so many in the church don't understand their spiritual authority. And that's why I'm teaching about it now. And I want to share that with you because today I'm going to be talking about, continue talking about spiritual uh, uh, authority. I'm going to continue to talk about uh, 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 um, ruling over the and winning the battle of the mind because the enemy is coming after the mind but there are some things that I, I want to, to share as it relates to that and as we move forward with today uh, there are three areas there are three areas that the enemy will, will come through open doors in our life through relationships through unrepentant sin and through uh, relationships, unrepentant sin, and through um, ignorance. Any area that you are ignorant, you're moving into things perpetually. You're doing things and you don't know what you really get into. It doesn't matter whether you're aware or not. The enemy will come through open doors and attack your life. Many of us are, have gone through things mentally, emotionally, physically. That was due to us not understanding how to properly enter a thing and then not properly knowing what it was we were moving into and the ramifications of how it was going to affect our life not only today but years down the road. Now this whole thing about mental illness and, 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 and this whole thing about uh, you know just the mental illness uh, craze that's sweeping our nation and our world. Uh, it's been growing uh, by huge numbers as the years progress and progress and I want to share a few uh, statistics with you uh, that's going to tie into where I'm going today. But also I want to share some quotes with you from some doctors who work in the field of uh, psychiatry uh, that work with mental, uh, in the mental health field 
some of the things they're saying about it. Because there is a view, there's a world view, but there's also a spiritual view. There's a spiritual view about this issue. And so I want to sh share with you what some of them are saying from a, psyche, from a psychological or uh, 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 from a, 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 a side that's not spiritual. Now this is Dr. David Kaiser. He's a psychiatrist. He states, modern psychiatry has yet to convincingly prove the genetic or biologic cause of any single mental illness. Patients have been diagnosed with chemical imbalances despite the fact that no test exists to support such a claim and there is no real conception of what a correct chemical imbalance would look like. Now, this is someone that works in the field. This is, this is a, a leading doctor, a psychiatrist that works uh, in the field of psychiatry. Now this is Dr. Ron Leifer. He's also a psychiatrist. He states, there's no biblical, there's no, I'm sorry, there's no biological imbalance, period. When people come to me and say I have a biochemical imbalance, I say, show me your lab test. There are no lab tests. So what's the biochemical imbalance? No one knows. Dr. Joseph Glenn Helen of Harvard Medical School, he's a psychiatrist as well, he states, while there is no shortage of alleged biochemical explanations for mental conditions or psychiatric conditions, not one have been scientifically proven. I'm going somewhere, so don't, 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 don't get ahead of me, just follow me. Dr. Elliot Valenstein, PhD, he's the author of Blaming the Brain, he states, theories are held onto not only because there's nothing else to take their place, but also because they are useful in promoting drug treatment. Now this is the problem with standard practice, and that's the reason why the church is needed in this day, is needed in this time. We have to know uh, from our side, you know, where we stand in order to give hope to people who are stuck from just a psychological standpoint, not really knowing how to move in and out of what they're dealing with. Now the problem with the standard practice, standard practice is, is what I just read, what most psychiatrists and the mental health uh, feel, how they, how, they, how they gauge and how they check and how they set the parameters for, for dealing with people with mental illness. I'm calling that the standard practice. Now this is the problem with the standard practice. According to the study and statistics gathered the United States Department of Health, the statistics show that 20% of Americans suffer from mental illness. Nearly 58 million Americans will suffer from an episode of mental illness in any given year, according to the National Institute of Mental Health. This is estimated stats that come from the year 2010. Now, I just want you to keep going with me, okay? Now, all of this stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm going to share with you right now is based on theory and not fact. Based on theory and not fact. Scientists have established the theory that classifies mental illness as a disease or deficiency caused by chemical imbalance in the brain that is corrected by psychiatric drugs. Studies show that this theory isn't supported by hard fact or genetic or biological evidence. So where are you going with this, Pastor? Just keep listening to me. Psychiatrists can accurately diagnose mental illness and have safe and effective treatments for it. This is what the theory is. Psychiatry is considered a valid medical specialty like cardiology and the claims of the movement based on the research that they found. Now what I want you to see here is the scale of what's happening in the world. Okay, tonight, today, I'm not just talking about something that's happening in America. I'm not just talking about something that's happening in, in our families. I'm talking about something that's happening in the world. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, he will raise up a standard. And so as a church, we have to be ready to come in and, and allow the Lord to raise us up as a standard. Especially when the world systems really don't know what they're, what they're doing with this, with this thing called mental mental illness and, and mental uh, instability. 
Now the global sales, listen to me now, the global sales of antidepressant stimulants and anti-anxiety drugs have reached more than $76 billion a year. Money, 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 money. Dollar bills, y'all. $76 billion a year. That sounds like an industry. <coughs> that sounds like a major booming industry. Okay? $76 billion a year. That sum is doubled the annual United States government budget spent on the war on drugs. Internationally, 54 million people are taking antidepressants known to cause addiction, violence, and homicidal behavior. Have you guys ever watched TV <coughs> and a new drug comes out and they talk about, let me give you this picture of all of this beautiful stuff that's going to happen when you take the drug and then before the commercial ends, they have this small writing and they say, you might, you might commit suicide and all this stuff it says. And it's, and it's quick. It's like 30 seconds. They spend, you know, uh, uh, no, I mean, not throughout that long, but, but it's, it's quick. They spend all that time selling you on this drug. And then they say stuff like, we'll make you bleed. Uh, or, or something. <laughs> You're like, whoa, I don't think I want to be healed. Not from that. I don't think I want to have to deal with that. And see, a lot of the problems that we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, y'all, sometimes when it comes to the issues that the world don't know how to address, Stats are showing that they're using drugs to pacify and to sedate, but it don't bring people closer to deliverance. It makes them more manageable for others, and it makes them more manageable in their life. But what we're supposed to be doing is being a standard and being a demonstration of God's power that we move people from bondage into deliverance and freedom. One in four women take mental health meds in the United States of America. That's 20% of the women. 20 million school children, now this is the scary part, 20 million school children in America have now been diagnosed with mental disorders and prescribed cocaine-like stimulants and powerful antidepressants as treatment for their condition. Last time I checked, people in my neighborhood that was on cocaine, they turned into crackheads. They became addicted to the drug. And so these drugs fix momentary problems, but they cause long-term issues. And so what I'm saying, I'm not speaking against pe you know, people using uh, uh, antidepressants because there are some severe cases that they needed in order for that person to, to survive and to be able to maintain until they can get to a place of trying to bring them into deliverance. And so I'm not saying, and I'm saying this so everybody can hear me here and those that will hear later. I'm not speaking against you using an antidepressant or drug uh, that is prescribed to you by a doctor if it's something that you need. But what I'm saying that I don't think it's fair and I don't think it's right to allow people to become addicted to a means to no end. When I say a means to no end, I'm talking about it's, it's, it's helping them, but it's not going to bring them to a desired end. They'll have to live dependent on that drug for the rest of their life. And that's never been God's intent. Never been God's intent. I think uh, you read through the New Testament. When Jesus came into people who were dealing with, with, with issues in the demonic realm that were dealing with mental and emotional issues, he delivered them. His power was strong enough to deliver people from all forms of affliction. And I'm telling you, we have the authority through Christ to walk free from every bondage and every trap that Satan can set for us. Now, I'm not going to spend this whole message on this, but I wanted to bring some, some clarity to some things and bring a better understanding to why I have to address it in the church because many, many, many people that call on Christ are dealing with it. There are many people that come into churches, y'all, that are on antidepressants and they're taking things to, to help them out. But I want you to understand that we have been given authority over these things. We've been given authority and we've been given authority to rule over what the enemy shoots at our mind. Now, I want to read this one last thing before I move into where I'm going. Combined spending on antipsychotic drugs and antidepressants jumped from $500 million in 1986 to $20 billion in 2004. All I'm saying, guys, in this, all I'm saying is this. This is a means to no end. 
We've been given authority through Christ to rule over every obstacle that Satan throws in our way. But mental illness, as we call it today, that's just a, that's just a side effect. That's a leafy thing. What I'm getting ready to talk about now is more of a rooty issue, okay? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to James chapter 1, verse 4. James chapter 1, verse 4. Now, this is the truth whether you like it or not. This is the truth whether you understand it or not. I'm going to go ahead and read it for you here. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. I'll read it again. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Every man. So there's not anything that we entertain, y'all. There's not anything that we entertain that we have not, we didn't have a desire for it, okay? And so the enemy knows this. And that's why God, that's why Paul in the book of Galatians, if you can go ahead and scroll with me to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to wait for everybody this time. I do apologize. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5. Here we go. I'm going to start in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to me. <clears throat> Paul is talking to the church in Galatia, in Galatia. He's talking to them. This is not people who are not saved. These are not people who don't know the gospel. He had to speak this to them because there were things they were doing that was, that there was no point of difference between them and the people that were living disconnected from God. No point of difference at all. And he recognized something. He recognized something that I have to get us to recognize. That the work of the flesh is doing something. It's on assignment from the enemy. And all of the open doors, all of these things open doors in our life. It opened doors for the enemy to move in. Let me explain something to you. There's not anything, anything that comes against our life that causes stress, that causes, that causes uh, 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 anguish, that don't come from the demonic realm. Nothing bad comes from God. The Bible says all good things, all good and perfect things come from God. So anything that causes anguish, Anything that causes you uh, 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 to suffer. Now we do have to suffer for Christ, but I'm talking about suffering like cancer and all of these diseases that come out. Mental illness, any form of mental illness, any form of mental uh, 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 disorders. Those things don't come from God. Those things come from the demonic realm. And how do they have access in our life? They have access in our life through open doors. Mental illness is a leafy thing. Depression is a leafy thing. Fear is a leafy thing. The root is the open doors that come in through the works of the flesh. But the works of the flesh don't open the doors. I'm going somewhere and I don't, I don't want to get there too fast. But there's something else that opens us up to these works. And that is what leads to every discomfort. That's what leads to every bondage. What I'm getting ready to share with you is what leads to it. And as the church, we have got to make a decision to shut the door. To go and, and, and to cut off the legal right of the enemy. Because anything you're dealing with that didn't come from God, it's, you're only dealing with it because there's legal right the enemy have to attack you. Did you not know the story in Job? When, 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 when God was up there with the council of, 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 of the Holy of Holy Council and, and here, here go the devil sitting there chilling and he said have you considered my servant Job? 
He didn't have a right to touch Job unless he got legal right from God or legal right through something Job was doing that wasn't like God that opened the door. Job was, was doing a great job. He was well pleasing to God. But sometimes, y'all, when we go through things, it's for the God to get glory from it. Now, God, the word says that God works all things together for our good, Kim. All things. God needed to see me and he needed to see some of you go through some struggles to come out. So others that saw you down also saw you resurrected like they saw Christ resurrected. They saw him beat on the cross. They saw him spit on. They saw him cast down. But they also saw him high and lifted up. They also saw the power coming from those disciples and those apostles that were left after he, he, he vanished. After he went back into heaven. So there was, there was demonstrations of his power that, that, that gave bear, bear, bear great witness with, his, with his, his death barrier and his resurrection. And God wants to be able to demonstrate that and show that through our life. I'm going somewhere and I feel in my spirit like you guys are pulling me like to rush me alone but you're going to miss what I'm saying if you don't settle yourself and let me give it to you and don't let me force feed you quickly because there's something else you want to do there's something I want to get you there okay but I'm feeling I'm feeling a pulling in my spirit and I, I want I want to go ahead and speak to that because I, I you really have to hear what it is that I spent all day barricaded in my room and woke up at 2 o'clock this morning to change some stuff because there's something God wants us to see and hear about this. Now, this is the key I want you to understand about the works of the flesh. Okay? And these are some key points. Illicit sex. Now, it says uh, adultery. But this, I want you to just focus on this. Illicit sex. When Paul mentions three kinds of illicit sex with the, with the uh, works of the flesh... Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. The first is a general term that encompasses all kinds of immoral sexual relationships or sexual encounters. When you move into something that's not like God, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, any of that stuff, bestiality, uh, pornography, fantasy, when you're reading those little journals, a little, no little books that, that, you know, that's kind of like, you know, taking you off in places you shouldn't be. It opens doors. And where does it open the door? In the mind. It opens the door in the mind. Now the scripture says when a man commits sexual immorality, he sins against his own body. But there are sins that we commit outside of the body. There are sins that we commit in our mind. But then there are also things that we do. And wherever we open up is where the enemy comes in. Through fantasy, through, through anger, pent up emotional stress and frustration, unforgiveness. And we don't forgive people. And we hold on to stuff. Or traumatic things that happen in our childhood. Demonic spirits will come in to our soulless part. Listen to me. Every human being is created in three parts. I got six up. But they're created in three parts. Physical body, soul, and spirit. Those three parts. There are two parts that the enemy will attack constantly, especially if you're a Christian, because he cannot touch your spirit. He can only afflict your soul, which houses your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul is the mind, will, and emotions of a person. And then your physical body. It is what it is. It's your physical body. Those two things will get attacked and will be assaulted by the demonic realm if you open the door. Anything that has to do with the mind. Like I said, religious heresy. This is another way he opens the door. Through idolatry. There are some people who watch uh, Housewives of Atlanta. They watch that little TV in the house, and that TV is an idol. You give more time to the TV than you do to God. You, some, you watch TV more than you eat. Some of you watch TV more consistently than you take a bath. You fall asleep watching TV, and you don't even take a bath. You give, you give great worship to that TV. It's an idol. And listen to me. That's the reason why the television and the computer is an open mechanism. If you use it incorrectly, it becomes an open door for enemy to invade your home, 
to invade your mind and even invade the mind of those children if they see the wrong thing on television. I got taken um, or enraptured by a spirit of lust through pornography that was introduced to me when I was eight years old. Outside, throwing the frisbee, doing what an eight-year-old is supposed to do. And I threw the frisbee and it went into the back of my dad's car. And I jumped in the back to get the frisbee, moving papers around, and then boom. A trap was set. Immediately, a fiery dart was set at my mind. And all the enemy wanted me to do was follow along, open up. He couldn't attack me, but he, he only could attack me with what was in my dad if I opened up. And some of you are dealing with some generational things. There are two ways that doors can be open. Doors can be opened personally by you or by your, somebody in your family that came before you. Now listen to me. Any door that's open must be shut. It can't be left open because Satan is not going to shut it. It's, it's giving him legal right. He knows the law. He knows how to invade and advance his kingdom in the lives of God's people. And he does it through open doors. The things we do with our body opens doors. The things we do is not like God. Now check this out. This is the reason why, this next point is the reason why I shared all that stuff about the mental stuff, okay? This is where I'm going. Witchcraft is a translation of a Greek word in which our English word pharmacy is derived. The Greek word could have been, could be a positive meaning of dispensing drugs, but it is more common meaning for the use of drugs in sorcery and witchcraft to poison people. Think about it. When you hear about these new drugs that are coming out, the, the, the Vigras and the Sierras and, and, and all that stuff, the, the Cialysis and all that stuff. It has little bitty words and it tells you what it would do to your body potentially. So, and they do it in small words. So, it, so they are putting it, they're putting it out there, but they're not really, really making you aware that this, though it's going to help you in some areas, it's really poisoning or going to hurt your body. And so, <clears throat> so the misuse of pharmaceutical drugs, it turns into a form of witchcraft. And when we open ourselves up to the misuse of pharmaceutical drugs, then we open the door. We open the door. Now, now check this out. This is the key. Pharmaceutical or illegal drugs fall under witchcraft as, the, as, the, as a work of the flesh. When the, now listen, this is, this is the only time it falls under witchcraft. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. This is the only time it falls under witchcraft. When the issuer distributes it as the answer to the problem and they know it's only an end means to no end. When they push it as, oh, it's just going to solve your problems, but it's really not and they know it, then that's a form of witchcraft. That's no different than a person in your neighborhood casting a spell on someone. Giving it to you as this, putting it in your food and making you think, oh, I'm not, you new in the neighborhood, I just want to pass this pie off to you. You know, I'm so glad to have you and your, your husband, your new couple here, and they give you something, and then I'm putting something in your food. That's no different. No different than for the FDA, Federal Drug Administration, to approve things that they know is killing, is killing people, that they know is causing birth defects in babies. That they know is causing people's life dependency and life expectancy to decrease. But for the sake of a dollar bill, they give it to you. They know it's illegal. It's going to hurt you. They know it's the reason why cancer and all this stuff has taken off. Because the things that the pharmaceutical companies and the food administration is letting us take on and eat and putting, oh, it's healthy. But it's killing us. That's a form of witchcraft that's coming through the government. These are ways that we open the door. And so, that's not coming through something you're doing. That's coming through what other people do. Now listen to me. That's even more of a reason why I understand now. When my mom would tell me to pray over my food before I ate it. To pray over it. Not because somebody with hot breath might have breathed on it. No, no. Because there might be something in it 
that is intended to harm me that's, that my mom is unaware of and that, and that I'm aware of, but the God who sits on high, who rules all things, through your prayer, the power and anointing of God can cancel something that Satan has set up to harm me. It's by simply prayer. So I'm telling you, pray over your food. Pray over it. Because there, we all know that there are things that's being done with our food. The food is green, it's red, but it has no nutrients in it. Do you know there, there are plants and flowers, there are vegetables that's being grown right now, that's being grown in the dark. Food that's supposed to get sunlight. But the pharmaceutical companies in this nation is manipulating the genetics of our food and they're creating it where they don't even need sunlight because they want to keep producing mass stuff so they can sell more products. But they make sure that it turns green, they make sure that it looks red, but it's not even getting the photosynthesis from the sun. It's not getting the nutrients it needs from the sun to give our bodies what it needs. So we're eating dead food. This right here is serious. And that's the reason why we have a spike in mental attacks that's coming against people's minds. We having all this stuff that's affecting people's body, affecting those little children. You know, I do believe that there are some chemical imbalances that are happening. I do believe that there are some. But because we don't have the technology to be able to measure it, we can't prove it. But there's, but like I said, I think all of that stuff originates from the demonic realm. And that's why I'm teaching about spiritual authority. So you can take authority over these things. Uh, the government of God is higher than the government of this nation. The authority we've been given through Christ is greater than the authority of the FDA. Amen. And so we have authority to rule over these things that are trying to rule over us. And that's why I'm teaching this. So, you can, so your vision can be broad and not so you can be suspect of the government, but so you can be, be more aware of your authority and why you need to use it and why you need to go by in the grocery stores and stretch your hands toward the, the, the food and walk through the grocery store and just pray over the food. Pray that God cancel some of that stuff that they do in the food and pray for people who are more dependent on drugs than they are on God. The drugs only, only lead them to be dependent for the rest of their life. But God has given me power in this hand to lay hands on the sick and they be recovered. God has put power in your hands to lay hands on the sick and they recover. But this is the thing. Will the church show up? Out there. Next Saturday we're going to be praying for a community. We're going to be knocking on doors and we're going to be offering people to pray for them. We don't want nothing. We just want to pray for you. Can we pray for you? That's what we're doing next Saturday. Because with the world needs us more than they realize. But before I can send us out, I have to get us to understand that we have power. We have power on the inside of us. We have authority. Okay? And I don't know what you came in here today dealing with, what's, what you've been going through, but you have power and authority over what's trying to rule over you. This is the key. Now, When Paul writes about the works of the flesh, he uses the Greek word ergos. You can write this down so you can look it up so you know I didn't just make that up. It's E-R-G-O-S. Ergos. It means, it's the Greek word for the word works. Now this is the key I want you to get from it. This word ergos sign signified some kind of action, deed, or activity. Now this is the main point. Very often it's referred to as a person's occupation. Now listen to me. The works of the flesh. Satan and his demons, they operate through the works of the flesh. Now when you hear the word work, like you go to work because it's your occupation. It's their occupation to occupy you. It's their occupation to find ways to get you to open doors. So when you hear the word works, just know in, in its original context, the word ergos means occupation. It means one's labor. It means effort or life. The demonic realm, listen to me, will give its life to ruining those children. They have nothing else to do but to work at destroying, to work at doing what the Bible says that Satan comes to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. 
but he can't do it, y'all, unless we open the door. Okay? And, and we're going we're gonna to talk about those open doors because I have something else to give you when you go home that's going to help you identify if there's any open doors in your life. Sometimes we don't know if there's open doors so we don't look at ourselves and examine ourselves. So I, I got something that I want to give you. Now listen to this. Because, because Paul connects this word to the flesh, he is telling us something important. Just like a person has a career or profession who works hard to achieve results, the flesh also has a work and a profession. And that is to rule, subdue, and have dominion over you and over your children. When the flesh is not surrendered to the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, it will work around the clock, 24 hours a day, to produce fruit that is hurtful or damaging and even deadly to your life. Look at me. There is a work that the enemy produces. I told you guys last week. The invisible realm is always on the scene, behind the scene, working in the scene. Even when you're asleep. That's why it's so important for you to pray over yourself before you go to sleep. Because you need rest. The invisible realm don't need rest. I want to say this. because I, 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 The demonic realm don't need rest. God and the angelic realm don't need rest because they're spirits. They don't they have a body, so they don't need to rest. So when you go to sleep, they don't be like, time out, y'all. Time out until Chica wake up. No. They work at you. They work on you in your, in, while you sleep through dreams. How many people in here have, have had in the last 30 days you found yourself having some troubling dreams? You've been troubled by dreams. Okay. That is a result of the work of the enemy coming at your life even while you sleep. If he can get an impression in your mind. Now, I'm talking about the enemy, guys. Listen to me. I'm not glorifying him, but the Bible tells us to, that we ought to be we ought to be aware of the wiles of the enemy. And too often in church settings, people get uncomfortable when a pastor starts spending this kind of time talking about the, the enemy. But when I played football, I studied my enemy. When I ran track, I studied, uh, you know, strategies to beat, the, beat my opponent. And so in, the, in, in our life as Christians, we have to understand the strategies that God has intended for us to earn, learn about the enemy so we can rule, subdue, and have dominion. If we don't know, then we fall under the category of my people perish because of lack of knowledge. They don't perish because they don't have power. That man on that film said, the enemy told him, go to church. Those people have no power. He knew we have power, but they don't know it. They're not using it. They're not walking in it. And that's why I'm teaching on things of this nature. Okay? Now check this out. The works of the flesh are designed to open doors in the life of humanity that give room to Satan to operate and carry out his design for each individual. Do you know that there is a design strategy for each one of you? Those children included. There was a design strategy for me at eight. Womanizers and, and, and men who, who had uncontrollable lust that couldn't, couldn't practice self-control came before me. And there was a design plan to go ahead and tap me while I was eight years old. So in hopes I might become a pimp. Or I might become a baby daddy. Or I might become a womanizer who sleep with all the women. Who, who, in hopes that I might get HIV. In hopes that I might be an absent father. Who knows what their design was. But that was one of the ways they designed to get a hold in me. To work through an open door. And guess what? I opened the door. For over 20 years I struggled with pornography. And masturbation. And things that started with that door opening as a kid. Because, you know, you know, Escape had a song back in the day called, Who can I run to to fill this empty space? Who can I run to when I need love? But as a kid, who can I run to to tell about how I felt when my dad left my mom with all eight of us? Who can I run to? I couldn't go to her and talk to her. She was already in pain. So that door, that door was open through trauma. And then that was my escape. But my question is, what's been your escape? What's been your escape that you've held on to for years? For some of us, it's, for some of us it might be sex. For some of us, it might be food. For some of us, it might be gossiping. For some of us, it might be uh, 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 imagination, daydreaming. 
having a different world. For some of us, myself included, it's going to the movies. The Lord had to help me understand through the course of this teaching that, Eric, you go to the movies so much because you like to escape reality. Just like you would go to the internet or go to a magazine to look at pornography to escape when you was feeling down. And you needed something to escape to take your mind off it. And then when I got old enough, I went from that to women. Escape. Some, and, and, but this was, a, this was a mental thing I was dealing with, y'all. That wasn't anything physical. That wasn't a chemical imbalance. My, my daddy did, didn't have a genetic of a, 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 of, a, of a loose man in his genetics and it came to me. It was an open door that came from the demonic realm that I opened the door to willfully. And it began to tear down my life. Even when I became a minister in my early years as a minister, I struggled with that. I couldn't even watch the women walk, up the, walk down the aisle to drop their offering. I had to look up at the roof to keep from looking at them inappropriately because I had a womb that I was afraid to open up and talk about because of the shame and the guilt but at some point I had to decide I had to talk to somebody because I needed to shut the door I needed to shut the door because God knew Eric one day you're going to be a pastor and you're going to have to be able to love people wholeheartedly you're going to have to be able to, to make a good decision I'm not, I'm not going to tell you in the, in, the, in the process of my singleness that I haven't made some bad decisions. But at this state in my life, in this stage in my life, I'm committed to shutting the door. And so the title of today's message or, or the thought I want you to remember is come out and close the door behind you. Come out and close the door behind you. The works of the flesh are works that yield to the fruit that comes. The works of the spirit nullify the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 through 26. You guys can go ahead and turn to that if, if you want to or, or if you trust me I can read it for you. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 through 26. Please write this down even if you don't go to it because I want you to read it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 26. For the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and read it. It says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the spirit... You are not under the law. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So here, let me stop right here. So Paul is telling us this is what's going to counteract the works of the flesh. This is what's going to counteract those doors being open if you walk according to the Spirit. Now jump down to verse 22. Now instead of yielding to the works of the flesh, we have to practice daily to yield to the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Listen to me. Listen to me. We have to crucify our flesh and their desires. We have to crucify, meaning that we have to, we have to, how, Pastor, how do we crucify our flesh and our desires? Simple. When Pastor says, look, we need to get up at 6 o'clock a.m. and pray because there are things that we need to cover. Well, that's not what I do. I don't normally get up at 6. That's not really, I'm not really a morning person. Crucify the flesh and call into the phone, phone line. Crucify the flesh. When you've been with your wife and, 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 and she's right and she's telling you the right thing to do, Michelle, and your flesh rises up and you're like, man, please, I don't want to hear what you got to say. Crucify the flesh and choose to be long-suffering, Daphne, when he won't listen to you. Be long-suffering. That's how you crucify the flesh. And so every day, y'all, we have to work at yielding to these things, joy and peace. Stop the bickering. 
Stop the arguing. Stop the things that keep you separated. And pursue peace. I have somebody sit, uh, put a horrible uh, uh, Facebook message on Facebook this week that was from my family. And I, I, I grudgingly had to get on, on social network, or social media, I'm sorry, and I had to speak to it. And I had to start it by saying, I pursue peace, not war. We have to pursue peace. These things, if we, keep, if we don't pursue peace, we open the door to unforgiveness and bitterness. And check this out. That will keep you from being able to inherit the rights that come to us as Christians. If you don't forgive others, you can't be forgiven. You want God to forgive you of everything that you've gone through, but do you want to hold somebody hostage to something that happened to you when you was 10 and something that happened to you was 5? You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go because that's going to keep a door open in your life, okay? Now, this is another key. We must crucify the flesh because it destroys. Now, this is the thing that's important, y'all. We have to crucify the flesh because it destroys our relationship with God. There's no other relationship more important than him. A husband or wife will leave you. They will die. Y'all will be happy one month and then mad the next month. But your relationship with God is the most valuable thing. You cannot afford to lose that. You cannot afford to let stinking thinking and letting habitual sin and unrepentant sin keep a wall separated. That's what the enemy wants. <clears throat> he wants to isolate you and get you isolated by yourself. That's why he has to get you to hold on to unforgiveness. So he can send some other agents into your life to further bind you and, and further put you in chains. Okay? So we have to crucify the flesh. Listen to me. We have to crucify the flesh. The Lord said that to me this week. He said there are some things that you guys and I, we have to crucify it. There's some, there's some pride you got to crucify. There's some unforgiveness you got to crucify. You have to close the door. You have to go to that person. Or if that person is no longer alive, you have to tell God, I forgive them. And when you do that, guess what happens? And boom. A door is shut. But as long as you leave it there, it's open. And you open game. Legal right to the enemy to attack your life. Right, now, now check this out. Mental instability of any sort. Now, now listen to me. This is the point I want to make. Mental instability of any sort finds its origin in the demonic realm. It's not genetic. Diabetes is not genetic. It's habitual. Meaning that you eat the same things that your family ate. And you practice the same things they do. And so then you open the door for sickness and disease to attack your body. It's not genetic. High blood pressure is not genetic. It's habitual. You open the door when you practice things. These things, these things have to be practiced. They're, when God created you, he made you perfect. He didn't do nothing wrong in you. It's only when we became connected. Now there are some things that come through the blood of our family members. And they are inherited, they're spiritually inherited. And they're called the demonic realm. They attach. And they go from family member to family member only based on the fact that doors are left open. And they never shut them. They never shut them. I'm going to be honest with you. My family struggles with pride. Pride, arrogance, and self-righteousness. Oh, oh. And that is something that that's an attitude that's transferred through social interactions. Well, my, my dad acts that way, so I'm act that way. I don't even know why I have a problem with Toya, but my mama have a problem with Toya, so I got a problem with Toya. Toya didn't even do nothing to you, but my mama got a problem with Toya, so I do. That's social. But and pride, pride is I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm better than you. You're, you're just a Washington, or you're just a Watkins. You, you're not a little. You know what it means to be a little? It means I'm not you. That's a good thing. That's pride. And that opens you up. That opens you up to be brought low. Because what does the Bible say about pride? 
Our haughty spirit and pride goes before the fall. You, you rise up in pride and he brings you down. Now what does he say about the humble and the meek? It says the humble and meek shall inherit the earth, but the proud shall be brought low. And so when you walk around and you carry pride, what you're doing is that you're opening the door for Satan to have legal right to take you down. And it's the thing. When a person with pride falls, the Bible says their fall is great. But when a humble person is exalted, you, a lot of times people who, who are humble, they don't, if anybody tell you they're humble, they ain't humble. <laughs> a humble person wouldn't tell you they were humble. They'll just be humble. No, nah, no, nah, I'm a humble guy. I'm, I'm, I'm a humble guy. You know, I'm, I'm humble. You know, if I tell you I'm humble, I'm not humble. A humble person would never tell you that. Only a proud person who's trying to be humble would say, well, you know, I'm, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm a humble guy. I, I don't, uh, yeah. no, you're not. You're not humble because you said it. It's kind of like a man that says, I'm the man. I'm the man in this house. No, you ain't. You had to announce it. And you had to keep announcing it. Then, then you're not. Because um, if, you, if you are a man or if you are, I'm a Christian, you understand I have power? No, you ain't. If you got to say you have power, you don't have it. It should be demonstrated. And that's what God is after, y'all. He's after us being a demonstration for him. I needed to rise up from the place that mental illness or on the place that the mental attack came on my, on my life in 2003 took me. It took me to a mental, in, in, uh, some kind of insane place. When I walked in there, I said, I ain't supposed to be in here. But it took me in that place because I was trying to take my life at 25. But God intended for me to go through that because there were people that watched me fall, but there were people that watched me rise up again. And in my rising up again, there were people who would go through the stuff I went through. And now I would have the grace and the anointing to stand with them and to undergird them and to help them. Some of you have dealing with depression. But there are going to be people who deal with depression. And you can't be afraid to acknowledge that you've been there. And you've done that. And you got to be sympathetic to people. Some of you, some people have been born in, in poverty. And, 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 and it makes them feel some kind of way to ask. For help. But we have to become a family, a church community that we do what the Bible says and that we are our brother's keeper, that we look out for one another. And you don't wait for people to come to you, you go to them. The Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's taking on the mind of Christ. That's taking on the <clears throat> that's taking on the, the mind of Christ. This brings me to my last point or my last stage. The mind of Christ versus the carnal mind ruled by Satan. So, Pastor, what is double-mindedness? <laughs> I'm not talking about it from a, from a psychotic or, well, not psychotic, but a, a psychiatric or, or, you know, standpoint. I'm talking about it from a religious standpoint. Double-mindedness is when the mind of Christ is struggling with the carnal mind that's at enmity with the mind of Christ. Meaning, there is a way and a standard in which God sets for you to live and for you to think. And then the enemy will send through these open doors and things that I'm talking about. He'll send things into your life to, to start a war in your mind. The Bible says, the just shall live by faith. We shall walk by faith and not by sight. And then the enemy sends through the carnal mind, fear. And fear attacks faith and to try to, try to, tear it, to tear it down and keep you from being able to stand. Now check this out. Double-mindedness. Well, actually, I'm going to, I'm going, actually I'm, going, I'm going to read Romans 8, verse 6 through 7. It says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. So the, so, so the carnal mind of Satan will attack the mind of Christ that's trying to be formed in you. Young man. <coughs> Double mindedness is the result of open doors. Now. I'm going to share these three, op these three ways that doors are open and then we're going to close for the day. I've been talking for 53 minutes. So guys, give me about six more minutes.
Here we go. Fear and unbelief, wrong relationships, and willful and unrepentant sin is how Satan is coming through to destroy lives today. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of the whole fear and unbelief is trying to drive some of you. Some of you have been struggling and you find yourself struggling with fear and unbelief. And that fear and unbelief is what's got you double-minded and unstable. Fear and unbelief. God is calling you to stand in faith, but fear, which is coming through the carnal mind of Satan, is attacking your faith and it's causing you to be, okay, I'm good today. I'm good this week. I'm good this month. And then, oh, I'm not good for the next three months. And you go back and forth. And so God is calling some of you out of a place of struggling with fear. The Lord says, what you fear, it won't come upon you if you stand in faith. But being in unstable and letting it toss you back and forth, it's going to cause you to miss his very best for you that he has for you. Because the Bible said that it's impossible to please him without faith. And so we can't be unstable. We can't stand in fear and faith at the same time. You know, and I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be transparent with, parent with you guys. I have been struggling. I'm one of the people that have been struggling with fear and unbelief. Fear and unbelief. I start looking at the time that we've been together as a ministry. I start looking at all the stuff that we're doing and all the stuff that I'm doing and all the sacrifices that I'm making. And then I start looking at some, the results that I, that I see in front of me. And, I, and, and my expectation is that there would have been more. And so I'm standing in faith, but then fear starts to, to attack me because my, my wife, the bill, we move in here in a couple of months. And she just finished packing up her house. And the pressure of, oh my God, her house is coming. God, you know. Are you, are you with me, God? Give me one more sign. Make, make, it, make it clear before she come. You know? And so fear and unbelief starts attacking my mind. Because I'm not, the Bible says that the just shall live by faith and not by sight. But what I start dealing with fear and unbelief is when I start looking at stuff. And some of you are doing that same thing. You've been struggling with things you've been looking at. And it's causing you to become unstable. And that's where the enemy is coming in and sowing tears into your life. And so the Lord said today, he wants you to know that what you are fearing will not come upon you. If you keep standing in faith. But if you let fear keep pulling you back and forth on the pendulum, it's going to keep you unstable and double-minded. And therefore, you won't please God. And what God will release to you through faith, he, through faith, he has to withhold until you stand in faith and choose to decide. You have to decide, are you going to let fear rule you or are you going to let faith rule you? That's one of the things today I'm calling you out of. I'm asking you by the power and authority of Christ to come out of, fe of fear. And stand in faith. Now number two. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25 to 27. Please trust me. It said therefore put it away lying. Let each one speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Give no place to the devil. Now to give place to Satan through fear, unbelief, sin, relationships, willful acts of rebellion against God's principle, give room to Satan. Okay? To give room means to open the door to him. Doors are open only through legal right. Doors are not open unless there are legal right for them to be open. Okay? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. He's looking for legal right. He's looking to see if doors are going to be open. Number two, I'm almost there, y'all. 
A person I want you guys to look up and I want you to read about this week that dealt with fear and doubt, and I want you to read about him, is Elijah when he was running from Jezebel. Okay? And so, when he was running from Jezebel, okay? Fear and doubt. And one minute, Elijah killing all the prophets, praying and fire coming down from, from heaven and consuming the altar. And in the next breath, it says that Elijah was running for his life, hiding in the cave, fear and doubt. But he was just standing in faith, but now he's cowering in fear. So don't let fear and doubt rule over you. Now, you guys write these scriptures down if you can. I'm just going to give you some, some notes to write down. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. These are, these are scriptures for you to study this week. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. It says, Fear not, for I am with thee. This is Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and I will strengthen thee. I will help thee, and I will uphold thee with my right hand. So we don't have to fear, guys, because God has us, because we are children of God. So we don't have to stand cowering in fear because God is with us. Psalm chapter 34, verse 4. The book of Psalm chapter 34, verse 4. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all of my fears. And the last one I want you guys to look at this week is Proverbs 29 and 25. Proverbs 29 and 25. It says, For the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be made safe. Okay? I want you to understand that. You don't have to stand in fear. Now, this is the big one right here. Open doors... Satan works, the, he works the works of the flesh into our life through fear and doubt because we take on worry and, and we take on, on, on fear. But he also opens doors in our life through relationships. There are some relationships that you guys are going to have to cut off or are going to have to really, really re-examine. Now, why are relationships so scary, y'all? Because they bring habits and tendencies <coughs> and thought processes. Amen. It's very rare that you hang out with a group of people and either your thought processes affect them or their thought processes affect you. But the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so there is a battle for the mind because whoever, has the, whoever rules the mind owns you. So if if the carnal mind rules you, then Satan rules you. If the mind of Christ rules you and establishes your life, then God rules you. Because as you think, so are you. Okay? <clears throat> and so here, I want you guys to read Judges chapter 16. It's going to give you a clear depiction of Samson and, and Delilah and that relationship. <clears throat> The relationship that evolved in his life that was not healthy uh, for him, but he desired it. And check this out. I'm going to read a little bit of Samson. I'm going to read a little bit of Samson uh, in, in Judges chapter 16. It says in verse 1, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot, and he went into her. <coughs> and verse number 2, it says, and it was told that the Gazites, saying, Samson is coming. And they encompassed him. They circled him up. They laid in wait for him all night in the city. Amen. Now check this out. Let's, let's skip down to um, verse 4. It says, and it came to pass afterwards. After he had that little run in in Hebron. It said, it came to pass that he loved the woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said to her, Entice him 
See wherein his great strength lies and by what means we may prevail against him. And so some people come into your life and they'll work. <clears throat> if, you're not, if you're not standing in your spiritual authority, you will let what's happening with them affect you. You don't normally cuss. You don't normally drink. You don't normally do that, Eric. Why, why are you doing that? You, you don't normally. That's one of my biggest struggles when I'm at work sometimes. <coughs> when a crazy conversation hit the office. And boy, it's a good juicy one too. And I have to catch myself and run in the bathroom me and get myself back together. So I won't run and jump headlong into that conversation and start letting other people's isms and schisms affect me. Because the moment, they could be talking about something juicy, but as soon as Pastor Little step in, they'll say, everybody want to get self-righteous now and say, hmm, I thought you was a pastor. <laughs> I am a pastor. But that doesn't make me incapable of having answers to every issue and problem that you raise up. But I have to handle each situation carefully because my interaction with people can reflect their relationship with God. Some people say, you know what, I don't want to have nothing to do with the church. Because I, I was hanging around a pastor for five months at work. And see, I see things about him. See, this is the reason why I don't come to the church. And that's a heavy burden for me to bear. But I understand that I'm bringing more than just my name and my person into the life of people. I'm bringing the very presence of God. And people will judge God by me. That's wrong. I don't like it. That's something I have to care. I don't like it. But some of you, you you're Christians. How many of you guys get that same from your friends? They see you coming. And then you have, to, you, can't, you have to guard yourself more than you are with them. Because you know that they'll judge God by the way they see you. And so you bring something into their life. But you got to also be careful what you let them bring into your life. Because that will create open doors. Habits. Tendencies. I'm going to be honest. I have one friend I hung out with. I, I used to never say the word. I never say the N-word so much. Until I got around him. And I was playing. And he, was, and he every word. Igga this, igga that, igga this, igga that, igga this, igga that. And then before you know it, I start saying, igga. I'm like, what's going on with me? I open myself up to a carnal, to his carnal, his carnal ways. And I start letting him influence in me where I should have been influencing him. So, so <clears throat> be careful of the relationships that you bring into your life and that you let. Don't be so quick to just let people in. Don't be so quick to do that because they bring agendas and they bring whatever spirits, whatever isms and schisms was with them, they bring it into your life. Don't be so quick to let people in. Set a standard for people. In. And then if they can't live up according to that standard and they walk away, then they, were, they, they, didn't, they didn't make it to be able to walk with you. How many times do you compromise for other people but they won't compromise for you? Don't compromise. Have a standard because your standard, your standing today might be winning that person's life for Christ five months from now. I had people, this is a, this is, this is a true story, no lie. I told a, my coworkers when I first started working, I, I got to Charlotte, North Carolina in 2004. I started working for a nonprofit organization and it was 99% women. On my first day there, I was intentional. They was all talking, we was all talking around the table and I said, you know, uh, they was asking me questions about me, and I said, yeah, I'm proud. I said, y'all pray for me, but, you know. Uh, they was like, why do why you have that band on your arm? I said, I've been practicing abstinence for six years. When I said I was practicing abstinence for six years, a holy hush <laughs> went over the whole room. They was like, is he gay? Is he gay, girl? Well, let's look. They, they was trying to see if I was gay. Like, <laughs> why in the world do all this? Why that dude like, ain't doing nothing? I said, listen, man, I just choose to wait. There's one woman I want to be with, and I want to save myself for that woman. It's bad enough I'm not a virgin, but I choose to have, be a standard for God and to just wait. I don't want to bring crap into my wife's life, so I'm going to wait. You know you'd be struggling. You know it'd be hard. Yes, it'd be hard out here for a, for, for a man. <laughs> it'd be hard out here for me, but, but, but what I'm waiting for on July 1st, y'all just be praying for her because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be God's man for her. On July 1st. Anyway, but uh, I told him that. Now, I had to weather the storm of per persecution. I had to weather the storm of women intentionally testing me. And I'm going to be honest with you. Eventually, after being there for three years, I failed twice. But I haven't done anything since. And that's been almost nine years. Okay? 
So you pass this beard on and straight up, okay? But listen to me. Because of my stance, two women came up to me and said, Hey, Eric, I'm practicing abstinence now. I haven't done anything in nine months. I was like, give me some. And it was because my standard first, they had to see if I was Memorex or if I was a true, genuine, you know, piece of work. And when they saw that I was genuine, they saw the, the standard of Christ coming from me. My relationship with them brought holiness into their life. But if I didn't have a true standard in my life, they would have brought harlotry into my life. <laughs> and that would have been bad but I'm just saying guys there's a price that comes with you being the standard and so I want you to understand my point is guard yourself in relationships because that's another way Satan works the works of the flesh into your life and opens doors to bring bondage into your life think about how many bad relationships you've had that worried you I was getting gray hair in relationships and I wasn't even 30 years old yet Worration. I, 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 I should own, I own stock in some of them, them, them companies that you go and did the test. The test. I should own stock in some of them companies. Got all my money when I was in college. Stressed out, man. <laughs> We're in relationships. When I knew I should have been saying no. But the pressure from, from her, I said yes. When I should have been saying no. And the Spirit told me, if you love her, then tell her no. And if she really wants to be loved by you, accept me saying no. But I fell to the pressure of how she was going to respond to me saying no. So I said yes. Yeah. Guys, it's time for us to close those doors. Amen. And stop letting those negative relationships bring things into our life. So close that door. And the last thing I want to say is willful and unrepented sin. Don't cry out. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. But you're sinning to the right, sinning to the left. You ain't turning around. You ain't trying to do right. You're just, you just riding the grace cloud. The grace, grace, grace. We're saved by grace. We're grace, we're grace. But you're going to run into, the, you're gonna run into God's wrath if you don't repent. And I'm not, I'm not preaching. You know, I'm not preaching. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not sin bashing anybody. I'm saying don't practice it. The Bible says a righteous man falls how many times? Come on, I'm trying to test you. How many times does a righteous man fall, the Bible says? What'd you say? Seven. Okay, all right, y'all learning. Huh? Seven. But how many times do he get back up? Eight. <laughs> he gets back up every time. But that don't mean that it's okay to keep falling to the same thing. My mentor when I was in college told me, son, I don't mind you falling. Just don't keep falling to the same thing. Change up on me every, every, every three months, fall to something else. But don't keep coming back to me with this same thing, man. You are stronger than the power of God and you are stronger than this thing. Yes. Quit letting this thing win in your life. And that's what I'm saying. Don't let unrepentant sin keep the door to bondages open in your life. Do you understand that something is simple? Listen to me. If I had cancer in my body, what would happen if I had cancer in my lung? What would happen to my body? If I had cancer in my lungs, what would happen to my body if it went untreated? Die. I would die. It don't matter what the unrepentant sin is. If you have it in your life, it puts the whole body in jeopardy. It's okay. Nobody already knows. But it's poison. It's death. And it's going to bring your whole life down. It's going to bring your whole life down. Do you know something as simple as unrepentant sin as it relates to a sexual issue could be affecting your finances? Yeah. Do you understand something as simple as not tithing and not tithing and handling your money, money correctly could be, could be affecting your health? It's cancer. Sin is cancer. You got to flush it out quickly. Don't let it sit and, and, and fester because it could cause jeopardy to the whole, your whole body it could cause jeopardy to your family. Do you understand that one man's unrepented sin as it relates to, let me just use, this is typical right here. Unrepented sin as it relates to pride could open the door to mental attacks in my bloodline for the next 20 or 30 years. One man's unrepented sin carries pride and it leaves the door open for legal access to the enemy. 
And so my whole crux for this whole message is to help you understand that the answer to any type of mental unrest in your life is the blood of Jesus. It's not Zantax or whatever that stuff they give y'all. It ain't that. That's just going to pacify you. It's not that, you know, that website you keep going to. It's not the little silver thing that they have a battery in it. It ain't that. It's not that relationship that you make more important than God. All of these things that we run to, we build dependencies on, and it affects us mentally and emotionally. We don't have to run to those things. We can run to God. Yes. We can run to the power of God. Now, who has that, 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 those packets? Ms. Tuka, can you pass those packets out and I'll explain to, to everybody what those are. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for being God. I thank you for allowing us to come together. And, and Father, I pray that this word and the words that we, we share every week bring forth fruit in our life a hundredfold. Father, I just pray that you would cause us to be a ministry and a people and a community that will grow in our spiritual authority. Will grow in the fullness of who you call us to be. And God, I pray that you would give me wisdom, supernatural wisdom. Far me on my years, God, to lead right, to, to teach right, to love right. And God, I pray that you would give me favor with this community. You would give us favor with this community, God, that we would be able to go in and touch the lives of the lost and touch the lives of those, God, that are misplaced and, and that are disenfranchised, God. Let us be a seed that falls into the ground and dies to church, dies to religion, dies to our selfish ambitions and our selfish intentions so that your kingdom can come in the Aftermath Springs region. Your kingdom can come in the Seminole County region and the Orange County and the Osceola County region. But God, most importantly, your kingdom can come in our lives who sit here today. Be glorified in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.